Hi, everybody. My name is John DePietro. And I'm Bob Zagami with the Camper Report Show. And on this Camper Report Show, I talk to the mayor of Elkhart, Indiana, because as we all know, Elkhart manufactures about 85 to 90 percent of all the RVs that are made in the United States. And we're going to talk to him about the economic impact that this industry has not on not only on Elkhart, but that whole northern Indiana, southern Michigan area. It's pretty interesting. Great, great. Uh, I'm going to talk to the man behind the plan, the man behind the KOA 2024 Camping and Outdoor Hospitality Report. And as always, it's an enlightening conversation. Uh, his name might be Scott. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, Scott Bear. Yeah, okay. Baron Consulting. Yeah. And we've got all the news of the week. Bob, where do we get our news? Where do, where do we um, take our news from? Oh, from Rick Kessler at RV Business and Ben Quiggle at Woodall's Campground Magazine. Couldn't, so, couldn't do it without them. Couldn't do it without them. We've got a great show coming up right here. Where, Mr. Zagami? On the Camper Report Show. Attention all RVers. Say goodbye to roof worries and hello to worry-free travel with RV Roof Magic. This revolutionary liquid butyl roof coating is specially formulated to protect your RV from the elements to extend its lifespan and prevent leaks. With simple application and outstanding results, RV Roof Magic is the go-to choice for RV owners seeking superior roof protection. Don't let roof maintenance issues hold you back. RV Roof Magic is the only liquid butyl rubber in the world that offers a one coat, no primer coverage, and a 10 year warranty. Visit rvroofmagic.com slash RV life and extend your roof another 18 to 20 years. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Camp Report Show. This is the news segment. My name is John DiPietro. That gentleman over there is Bob Zagami. And uh, Bob, one of the things that I read about the RV industry that you keep reading about the RV industry is that everything old is new again. And something that is very old was found and has been renewed. Do you want to uh, take the mystery out of my mystery? Yeah, head it, this is an amazing story. Uh, they actually found the first Airstream trailer created by Wally Byam, the very first. first Apparently story. discovered it in New Mex uh, Mexico City in 2017. It was in horrible condition. They brought it to the factory. They said it was in pitiful shape, but they actually went to a restoration company in Oklahoma, Silver City, Silver Lady Restoration in Oklahoma, and managed to bring it back to its original state, the number one Airstream in the world, and they now have it on sale, uh, not on sale, that's for right. sure. Probably couldn't afford to buy it, but uh, at the American Airstream Heritage Center in Jackson Center, Ohio. So for, for true Airstream enthusiasts, I'm sure they will be flocking to Jackson Center this summer to take a look at it and have this selfie taken with it. But it was, it was uh, certified as the number one unit Created by Wally Byam himself. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we found through working with Jim Roy at Silver Moose Restoration mm -hmm. yep. is that these Airstreams are built with quality bones, if you will, so that they can be renewed. And we've seen some of the stuff that Jim has done that has come in and looked like it had just been through a war and um, coming out looking absolutely magnificent, which really says a lot about the brand. Well, this, the first one was the Clipper. Now, they actually they put a lot of effort, time, money, and resources into making sure that they had the right unit. And this fellow named David Gully, who's uh, got one of the, the largest uh, one of the yep. Airstream collectors in the, in the world, and they got all those people together, and they went through all of the work to identify it and make sure that it was, in fact, number one. So... Head out to Jackson Center, Ohio, and have your picture taken with Clipper, num Clipper number one. Number one. So um, talk about there's the old, and now the new is, is it Harbinger? Is that the company? Harbinger is a manufacturer of chassis. and okay. uh, they, they, had, they had a big press release out that they've got several thousands of dollars or several thousand units on order for electric chassis. 
and Thor is one of their big customers. Okay. Yeah, they get four thousand units on order, and I I read the the headline wrong I, when I first pulled this one up. It says Harbinger announces four hundred million in EV orders from Thor. Oh yeah, yeah. Comma others. Thor so and. Well, wow, those investing four hundred million dollars? No, no, they are well, not. Look, However, there's a group of companies that buy lots of trucks and lots of vehicles. So Harbinger has four hundred million dollars in orders waiting for the shipments. Okay, now you've got the whole story in front of you. Re read the list of some. Read some of those companies that. Uh, Campbell Supply, Doggett Equipment Service Group, Ebby Ford, Ethero Truck and Energy, the, EV the bread company, right? Bimbo, the bread company. Yeah, they the Bim, yeah, Bim, okay. Bimbo Bimbo Bakeries. Okay, uh, and it's not a not a Bimbo Bakery. They make in the they're in, in the U.S. It's called Bimbo. Uh, they are uh, their brands include Sara Lee Bread, Thomas English Muffins, Entenmann's, and more. Okay, so. Here's why I'm going to tell you, uh, I'm going to throw a little water on these flames because I still don't think our infrastructure is ready for electric RVs. Now, why do I bring that, bring that topic up in that way? Because I asked you to name those companies off because those trucks leave a building at seven o'clock in the morning and are generally back at least by seven o'clock at night. And they have dedicated facilities where they can go plug in at the end right. of the day, and in the morning are recharged. That's what Amazon does. You see those, right. uh, Amazon, yeah, the Amazon trucks that are made by Rivian, okay? So they can get a whole day's work out of that. The So they have a start time and an end time, and they have generally a short geographic area. The difference between those vehicles and RVs is that RVs don't start at the same place every day and end at the same place. They travel from point A to point B and not necessarily even come back to point A, which leads me to say that the problem is going to be in charging these electric EVs. And I saw it uh, just a month or so ago when somebody was towing a boat with a Rivian and he pulled into the charging station with this Rivian, and the interesting thing with Rivians is you charge those from the front, um, but he had to block the whole road or disconnect the boat. He decided to block the whole road, okay? If you get a 35, 40-foot motorhome, you can't easily go into an area, and I'm presuming these are class A's or, A's or C's, um, you know, that style. You yeah. can't go into the standard places for public charging and not be a disruption. So unless you're going every morning from your house and have a location at a campground, and campgrounds do not yet have those facilities to charge electric vehicles. They're getting them, but they don't have them yet. Um, I think that all this talk about uh, the electrification of the RV industry is still very premature. And that is coming from someone who owns an electric car and have for I don't I don't disagree with your reasoning, but I think what we're looking at here is an investment from Thor to keep it away from some other people, but they yeah, probably that, don't expect a return on that investment for 10 years. They understand they've already taken a shot at electrified RVs with the, a lot of them doing the Mercedes and uh, small RVs and they've taken them they've taken a back seat to them. They pulled them out. They they haven't brought them to the market. You know, Winnebago was ready two years ago to bring it to the market and have put that on the back shelf. So I think, but I think you're right. And I don't understand why we don't see more of it with taxi fleets, small bands that they can do just that, use them all day, go back and charge them up. And they would have been a lot smarter uh, on this strategy if they had done that and got it out in front before all the negative criticism of the downfalls of the infrastructure. And right. in the Secretary of Transportation, Buttigieg was on national TV today, uh, yesterday on the Sun, no, Sunday shows, trying to defend the policy of this administration to have 5,000 5, charging stations, 50,000, I think, yep. by 2030, the end of the decade. And so far, 
they built eight and he tried to say, well, it takes time Next one. to get this out and get the infrastructure and whatever. It's just poorly played in uh, yeah. no, no realization of how the public was going to do it. They were just so greedy yeah. to get EVs out there. They didn't think about the consumer one bit. And I was an early adopter. Right. They'll hook, line, and sinker for it. And um, the key thing is this. I won't buy another one now, not because the, I love my vehicle. I love my Volkswagen ID4. Okay. But charging it, I, uh, just before we, just at th a half hour ago, I was charging my vehicle. I had to go to, I had to try it three times before it finally caught. And, you know, go into a gas station. I'm in and out in five minutes, in, in three minutes. So anyway, that's that with the electric. The third thing is that we're starting to see an uptick in RV sales. And um, what was the month we're talking about? April RV sales or April up RVs? 9.5%. Yeah. You got some of those stats. Yeah, this, this is actually a good sign because they've come through the first quarter uh, with an, you know positive uh, over last year. And now we're getting into the really good, we'll be getting the May results that there was a lot of traffic at the dealership. So in the summertime has good sales. So hopefully that, that trend is going to con continue on what they were doing. Uh, so that they had 120,000 units shipped through April. The downside, and it still baffles me, and I talk about it a lot, is the park models were down 6.2% compared to the same month last year with only 453 wholesale shipping. And I do not, with the increase in destination camping, with the quality of the park models, you and I were out at uh, Elevation RV. Uh, toward the factory, did our uh, our being in New England show from the factory, outstanding product, amazing quality, and and that's true of, of all the park model manufacturers, whether it's Elevation or Krupp or Woodland or uh, Athens or Layton. There's, there's good brands out there. I don't know what it's going to take to light a fire under the consumers to uh, really take a, a hard look at yeah. it. You know. A lot of people that do know about it, but I, I still say it's the best kept secret in the RV industry. Yep. Yep. There we go. There's the yep. news of the week brought to you by our friends at RV Business in Woodall's Campground Magazine. Special thanks to Woodall's because we're going to be uh, heading to Canada in uh, the month of July to cover some um, events up there. And one call to Ben Quiggle got us right in touch with the people who are in charge of camping in Canada. So um, that's cool. And um, we'll have a great time. In the meantime, what's the name of this show? The Camper Report Show. Stay with us. We'll be back right after these messages. Hey there, RVers. We get it. Your insurance and warranty needs are as unique as your travel destinations. That's why RVer Insurance has teamed up with Wholesale Warranties to cover all the bases. From health insurance to RV coverage and warranties, we've got you sorted every step of the way. With a solid track record in providing top-notch health insurance and affordable RV insurance options, RV insurance has you covered. And for those unexpected repair bills, look no further than our friends at Wholesale Warranties, leaders in reliable coverage and customer support. Start your RV protection journey today at rverinsurance.com or wholesalewarranties.com slash RVer insurance. All right, welcome back to the Camper Report Show, everyone. And my guest today is our friend Scott Baer, Cairn Consulting. I always say he's the best market research in the country when it comes to outdoor experiences and the people who enjoy it and the people who service it. And uh, his big claim to fame, of course, is the KOA annual report and it's got a different title this year uh and it's their 10th year scott yeah it's um it's kind of wild to think about 10 years 10 yeah. years of doing this. And, and uh yeah the, the the title got shortened a little bit to it's the outdoor hospitality report now um and you know in, in so doing we we've, we've dipped our toes a lot more into the outdoor hospitality sector what that means so it's it's been it's been a fun 10 years getting and to this point. And it's interesting to see where where the industry is because it's really, I think, ready for 
they always like to say a paradigm shift, but I think we are going to see uh, a big shift in the years ahead. But of course, you're the man who studies it and presents the findings to KOA. And I understand that you put a little twist to it this year in terms of a little bit more data science on developing just what the industry is. Tell a little more about that in, in consumer terms. In in terms of the, the data science, what what I like to do is I, I call it um exploratory research, where where in, in some cases people will gather information under the assumption that they already know or have a kind of a guess what's going on. Um, I like to use an exploratory approach, which is to use a, a, some different techniques to look at within the data sets, um, some of the different interactions, um, what's driving behavior statistically. So you're, you're going to look at these outcomes of this analysis and say, oh, here are some of the, the things that are driving behavior. Here are some of the things that are important to campers and guests statistically. And what we do is, is then dovetail that with, with what people actually say. So we combine these this data science with interviews and speaking with people and on the ground information gathering. So it's it's a it's a great process and we feel it's very strong in terms of the outcome and what what people see at the end of the day in terms of the, the information we provide. Why, why did you feel it was so important this year to uh, change the process a little bit? Um, because we took the taking the idea of outdoor hospitality and what does that mean? Um, it's thrown around a lot. There's from the origins of the term, which I know some some folks who lay claim to it. I I don't know personally, but <laughs> um, and so I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to create any controversy. Right. But I also feel that outdoor hospitality is used a lot, and my take on it was, and with the blessing of KOA, to let's put some science behind this. How does the person, the participant, define it? Because I wanted to take some of the ambiguity out of it to actually say, here's here's what we think it means, and and how uh, you know someone who say they arrive at a campground or any location or they hire a guide, how do they view it? How do they view what? what fits into the definition of outdoor hospitality and importantly in what we're talking about RVing and accommodations um, how do those fit into how people define outdoor hospitality interesting um, when you when you look at this the totality of the report you, you could go off in so many different sec sections there's, there's 10 sections to the report and you're going to expand on the monthly reports. And one of the things that uh, I thought was quite interesting during Toby's talk at the uh, RV Power Breakfast was this, I think it's a new category. I don't think I've seen it before, but the car camper, how did you evolve into that? How did you come upon that? And, and what impact is that gonna have on future? Because logic would say, if you're camping in a car now, you might go to a tent, you might go to an RV, or is there something about car camping that we should be looking at? This category is something that popped up um, recently in, um, I was doing a, a talk um, to a group of um, outdoor retailers. And after the talk, uh, this gentleman approached me and asked about the category, car camping. I go, yeah, well, we, we have car campers, our traditional, definition of car camping, which is, say you drive to a campground in your vehicle, set up your tent or whatever, that's that's considered car camping. That's how we always defined it. Um, but and he was like, no, he goes, these are people who actually travel and sleep in their vehicle um, other than an RV. Many times it's cross, it can be crossovers, a lot of, a lot of Subarus out there, people are using... Right. Um, so we decided that we we needed to dive into this category because it's like, are there a lot of people actually doing this? And there are. 
And there, there's a surprising number. And it is something that I think the industry needs to pay attention to because this group of people, they're, what's what's pushing them into this is affordability. They are, in many cases, already own a vehicle. But um, the solo traveler, they feel um, either they don't need a lot of extra space, they don't need a lot of extra bells and whistles, and importantly, they feel safer in their vehicle than they do in other forms of, of camping and other types of accommodations, other than like a cabin. RVs are great for safety security too, but for many of these people, it, it can be affordability uh, but and can, can the convenience of it, they can park almost anywhere until someone kicks them out. Um, they have challenges. Some campgrounds won't let them sleep in their car. So they'll, sometimes they'll set up a, um, a tent and then put their gear in it. But yeah. it, it, it's a it's a growing category. It's very yeah. popular. And it's something that, again, we're, we're measuring and we're seeing the growth in it. And we're seeing um, it as a highly accepted form of travel. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that was very interesting in the report was your uh, review of the impact of COVID. Now, COVID came six years into the 10-year span of, of this report and turned the industry on its head. Uh, you also report on what life would have been without COVID. Talk talk a little bit about that and uh, what it's done for the industry or to the industry. The, the Well, as as you mentioned, it it really pumped a lot of new people into to the outdoors uh, for a number of reasons that we've we've talked about a lot throughout the last few years. Um, but I think you know, overall, when we look at um, the trends, we were trending up anyway, but it was at, around that five percent growth each year. And um, right now, where we sit, we sit. You know, had it not been for COVID, we're above. What we would have expected without it um it's it's normalizing a little bit but it's it, it's still you know when we consider if you know looking at this year's report you can see that yeah uh, we were down a little bit in in 2023 but um we're above in 2023 where we um would have been otherwise had it not been for covid so we're trending you know we're, we're trending along those lines and i've Anecdotally, I've spoken with some folks in the RV industry who have said similar things that if you draw the trend line from 2019 to now, it's where you would expect based on where the growth had been. So COVID would disrupted everything, obviously. It changed it changed what we do and how we do it. But we're we're still, I think we're still in a very good position. Okay. What um what areas of the report um caught your attention a little bit more than others are that you feel add a lot more to the report this year based on the categories or the statistics that you worked with? I think what um, the, you know, and, and again, it's one of those things that I like to talk about personally because it's important to me. But when people consider hospitality and what it means, and when you put the outdoor in front of that, what does it mean? The One of the things that's important and it crosses all boundaries is the human element. The, in, in order to be hospitality, in, in order to have that that experience, it, it takes a, the human element to be involved, whether it's staff, um, as well as other campers, other guests where, where you're staying. There's a great deal of onus put upon the other guests in contributing to the atmosphere and the hospitality that people perceive when they go somewhere. And camping is really unique in that, that regard, where people see the situation way differently than they did. do say staying in a hotel people you, there are things you can do on a campground that you could never get away with at a hotel <laughs> um you have people you, know, you don't see people stepping out of their rooms at a hotel and their their robes with a cup of coffee saying howdy you know but at a campground people do that they you know they step out of their camper and with their coffee and they say hi and and it's just a, it's a very different um environment and it's that human element and to me i wanted to quantify that and i feel like we did this year and that was that was super important to us and you know a lot there's a lot of interviews as well included in there talking to actual campers in great detail well the other thing uh and you speak about it at the end of the report you kind of take a look at the next 10 years so you've had this 10 years and we have 
an outlook for the next 10 years. And uh, Toby, Toby mentioned the, the growing um, entrance into what we might call the outdoor hospitality space by legitimate five-star, four-star hotels and, and that they're allowing camping or they're either building a campground next door or they're doing things for the for the campers to, so that they can take that outdoor hospitality group and gravitate them towards the hotel motel. Talk a little bit about that before we wrap up. That That's an important part of what where things are heading overall. And that is being driven by the idea, especially of glamping and outdoor resorts, bringing in that leisure traveler who normally wouldn't camp. So that's fulfilling that. I still believe that there will continue to be a lot of growth in campgrounds, the traditional types of campgrounds. The That type of outdoor experience is going to continue to grow. Some new entrants into camping itself are are fulfilling the desire by others to do that the blended travel. We talked about that a bit as well. People who blend other types of stays and accommodations during their trips. We saw the the increase of road tripping, which, you know, a lot this year, the people are slowing down a bit more. They want more convenience. We saw a bit of that. The convenience factor is drawing a lot of people into those types of environments. But at the end of the day, people still want to camp. They still want to have the outdoor experience and it's still the strongest and it is the most emotional experience people have. Yeah. I, yeah. I was intrigued when uh, Toby mentioned that they actually have now have a hotel in a KOA campground. Finish up with that. And uh, our guest this morning is Scott Bear Cairn Consulting that does all the marketing research for the KOA annual report. But, but talk about that one, a KOA with a hotel. Yeah, this is something that we've um, included in our, our internal research with, with KOA and, and looking at you know, the acceptance of that as a, um, a, a mode of staying at a KOA. The KOA brand draws them in, draws people in. Um, it draws people in because the, of how they view that. I, I personally, I know I'm biased, but I'm, I personally don't think it will work for everyone. Your, your brand and your facility needs to... Um, have a certain level of credibility already for people to see that as a viable option. And, uh, you know, KOA has, has done that because, again, you bring in guests that you normally wouldn't. These are not your hardcore RVers and, and other types of campers. These are folks who are looking for a little bit more convenient type of stay. They want safety, security. They want a solid roof over their head. And they're willing to, uh, but they, they also want to stay at a reputable brand. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, real quick, what are you looking at for the next 10 years? I'm I'm seeing a couple things I think that, that are gonna happen. Um we'll 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 continue to see these types of development developments um grow. They'll they'll continue, but it's gonna be kind of what I call the multifaceted um parks that have all those options. They're gonna have a place for people to get away and have a little bit more rustic experience, but they're also gonna have higher end facilities and amenities. And it's gonna be done, you know, in, in the consumer themselves will pay for those different types of experiences. I think it's that, that's gonna be the mix, but I, I think traditional camping, and maybe I, I'm showing my age when I say this, but <laughs> I believe that as I said a few moments ago, that that is the draw. It is being outdoors. It is sitting around the campfire. It is having, you know, whether it's meal preparation, all those things, you know, roasting hot dogs and making s'mores. Those are the things. And the connecting with friends and family. And I, there's one thing I, I talked about this year and I think it's going to continue to grow in the next few years. And that's that's disconnecting to reconnect. They, people want to disconnect more even the younger folks to yep. reconnect with, with their friends, family, with the outdoors themselves, you know, and it's very, like I say, the emotional part of it is what drives that. And I don't feel that in the next 10 years, we're going to lose that emotional connection. I think it will continue to grow. I, I agree with you, Scott. Thanks for joining us again. It's always a good time of year to catch up and look forward to uh, camping this summer. So thank you. Take care. And we will see you down the road. Thank you for having me. So we're talking to the mayor of Elkhart, our friend Rod 
Robertson. There you go. Without the T. Very well said. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, you know what? You're here in front of 1,300 people that uh, put money on your uh, your city coffers. It, it's not many cities in the U.S. that have one industry that is so dominant. Uh, does that make it special for you to be here? Oh, it's very special. You know, this is a leading industry in our county, in our country. Uh, but specifically for Elkhart, it is uh, the leading industry that we have, but it also innovates and creates entrepreneurial opportunities in so many different ways through, our, through the supplier base, which is also located here, uh, and through the, the, the technology that it brings. Uh, and so, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we all know that uh, Amazon is one of the leading technically uh, uh, automated country companies in the world. It has located here as well. Right and, and it is located here because of the leading relationship that RVs has, have in our community and in our, uh, in our country. So, so the RV industry has led other industries to locate here for those same reasons. Absolutely. I know someday you'll be at the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield. No, don't put me there yet. Yeah. You know, in my mind I'm there. I may never be there actually. You're still too young. You don't qualify. For Thank you very much. I appreciate you. You need to interview me more. So what would you talk to uh, people all over the world that buy RVs that uh, emanates from here, but like you said, it spreads economic wealth throughout America mm -hmm. because you've got dealerships all over the United States. You've got service centers all over the United States, but without Elkhart, none of this is possible. Yeah, we, we, we are the epicenter for that, uh, but what's wonderful about the RV industry is that the industry that it's in, it's in leisure, relaxation, recreation. Uh, cities, as they recreate themselves, are trying to recreate themselves on that same model. Elkhart is far ahead of the pace on that. Uh, we are a legacy kind of rust belt, if you will, city in the Midwest, but we make things. And typically in a manufacturing community, it's hard to create the quality of life, quality of place relationship. It's baked in in Elkhart because of this relationship with the RV industry. So we're doing things in Elkhart in order to make it more livable, attractive, and all those great things for people. But the RV industry sets a model and an example for us to be able to actually lead together. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the RV industry and Elkhart, Indiana. A lot of great cities in the United States have new industries that have come in but they don't hire the local people. These leaders of this industry now, so many of them are homegrown people. Absolutely, I mean, Bob Martin and I yeah. went to the same high school. Oh, really? Yeah, we were coached Bob by- said you were there many, many years before him. Uh, not many, you could say, <laughs> you, you didn't have to put a plural on that. I was there a few years before him, but we were coached by the same great high school coach. We know each other very well. His his family and I know each other. I mean, and Elkhart has those interpersonal relationships that is so important to it. And so for us to be able to be in leadership positions in his industry and me as the mayor, it creates this kind of way in which we are able to pick up the phone and say, what is challenging for you and what's challenging for me? And we can actually work through it. The other cool thing is that you go anywhere from the corner office positions to the uh, entry-level laborers that have their chance to work up the food chain to uh, executive positions. That's what a city is all about. Unless you are empathetic enough to understand the corner office and the new guy that just came in off the street, then you're probably not serving your city or your business or your organization in a manner that is characteristic to growth, development, and making it a leadership, having a leadership relationship in its industry. So we pride ourselves in Elkhart in doing that. Thank you so much for spending your time here and wish you the best. Thank you. I appreciate it. RV Insights. Thanks so much.